Hi, everyone. I'm Professor James Adams at Arizona State University, and this is going to be our third uh, Facebook Live session on microbiota transplant for autism. There have been two previous sessions, but there have been a lot of new questions from uh, families about the progress and an update on our adult study and our child study, so we hope to cover that today. Um, so first of all, I want to begin with many, many thanks to the families who have been uh, providing donations to support our research. I am just amazed and overwhelmed and deeply appreciative. Uh, thanks to everyone's help, we've raised all the money we need for our adult study, which is tremendous. That's moving ahead. And we have made tremendous strides in raising over $600,000 for our next child study. So we are making incredible progress in just the first week. And uh, we hope to continue that to reach our goal of 900,000. So many thanks to uh, two anonymous donors who each gave $100,000, uh, one for our child study, one for our adult study. Uh, thanks to every donor. We appreciate everyone from people who gave just $1 to people who've given many thousands of dollars. We really appreciate them, especially appreciate the support from the fearfully and wonderfully made group who's, who's raised over a half the funding that we need for our child study. So just thank you, thank you, and thank you. Um, so uh, let's go ahead with questions. Uh, so uh, Devin? What is the big picture on the child and adult studies? So the big picture is that um, now that our adult study is fully funded, um, we, uh, thanks to donations from over a thousand people, um, we are now able to um, continue with it. Uh, the FDA has authorized our, our latest batch of microbiota, which should be enough for all the remaining participants. Um, and so that is currently being prepared for us at uh, University of Minnesota. Um, in about, we're still waiting on approvals from the uh, IRB and um, the Department of Defense, which is mm -hmm. also funding the work. Uh, they've already pre-approved the changes, but bureaucracy moves a little slowly sometimes with the government. Uh, but we expect to have those approvals probably within a couple of months. Then we'll be able to um, begin treating our next group of patients and begin looking at the um, over 500 applications we've received. Uh, and we'll uh, enroll another 50 from that group starting with the oldest group, starting with those who applied back in approximately April, and then just moving forward in time. Um, so that's a quick update on the adult study. We'll, we'll go into a little bit more detail later. Uh, for the child study, um, we, the FDA has approved us to proceed with the study. So they've authorized us to proceed with the study. Um, this, week I'll be, this weekend, I'll be finalizing the IRB documents and submitting those as well. They're going to the same IRB it's already approved our adult study. It's a very, very similar design. So we expect it will be approved in a few weeks. And uh, then as soon as the study's funded, uh, we'll go ahead and uh, begin recruiting probably within a month of when it's uh, funded. So um, it's, it's really up to the donors as to when we'll be able to start. Uh, since we're getting close, we're already putting out an ad for uh, two uh, study coordinators. We'll need to hire two new staff for the uh, child study. If you know a great study coordinator dedicated to children with autism, have them send me a resume. Um, uh, the other thing I'll mention is that um, once we um, have the authorization, then we'll go ahead and um, uh, officially advertise the study. After about one week, we'll review the uh, applications we receive and randomly pick people from that. We have over 1,500 families who have asked to be uh, notified when the study is ready to advertise. Um, and so we will send out a notice uh, on that as, as soon as we can. What about families that can't get into the studies? So we're doing a lot. We want to help every family that we can. Uh, Finch is working on um, uh, another child study that will be a bit down the road, but um, they're hoping to do that as well. Again, the more studies we have, the stronger a case we can make with the FDA for approval. Um, we also um, are hoping that if these studies are successful, uh, normally you have to go through phase one, phase two, and then even phase three trials. But because there's no um, FDA approved treatment for the core symptoms of autism, and because this treatment seems to treat the core symptoms, as well as the GI symptoms, uh, that we are going to hope to apply for breakthrough status. 
What that means is if our phase two studies, our child and adult study are successful, and we can ask the FDA to just approve it right then. And it's possible they will, it's possible they won't, but we'll do our very best and I hope that they will. If they do approve it, then we can go to market immediately. Uh, we'll still have to do a, a larger phase three study down the road, but that won't stop the marketing. Um, also, there are other treatments. We've done a lot of work in nutritional treatments. We spoke about that last time. But if you go to our uh, nonprofit website for ANRC, so that's autismnrc.org, you can learn about our ANRC protocol that we found was able to reduce GI symptoms by about 30%, uh, greatly improve developmental age by about 18 months, improve um, IQ by about seven points, uh, so we're very hopeful about that. We're also looking into two other treatments that I, I can't tell you about yet, but um, there are other things down the road that we are working on, believe me. Um, so we really hope to be able to help everyone with autism, uh, and we hope that these studies themselves are successful. So I'm going to ask some questions specifically about the child study now. Um, what is the exclusion criteria? So we can't fully um, disclose the inclusion criteria because it's still under review by the um, IRB. Uh, but basically it will be for um, children. Our plan, and this might change, but it, the plan is for children ages 5 to 17 years who have chronic GI issues, not so severe that it's um, uh, extremely serious, like ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease. We're working on a separate um, study for that, perhaps down the road. Um, but uh, that's the main criteria for getting into the study. Um, also, they do have to be able to swallow pills. Our pills are specially encapsulated to be able to survive the stomach acid. So they do have to be able to swallow pills. But we do have a pill swallowing video on our website, autism.asu.edu. So hopefully that will really help families. All right. Will the study start with um, 50 at once or will it be in batches at a time? Yeah, our study coordinators can only handle uh, so many participants at a time. So we'll let those families know that they've been approved. Some will start right away. Generally, we do batches of about 10 to 12 uh, children at a time. And so we'll uh, have them come. Uh, we'll do one batch and then uh, couple months later, do the next batch, and then the next batch. It just, you'd be amazed at the incredible amount of paperwork that we have to fill out for each and every child to really document, to really prove what we have to do. So it takes time, but um, we will be moving as quickly as we can. How long does one have to be in Arizona for? Um, they'll be need for the child study, either two or three trips to Arizona. Um, usually for just one or two days, um, typically two days um, is the amount of time. We have to have them seen by our evaluators to evaluate their symptoms, uh, checked out by a study physician, uh, blood draw in the morning. Uh, but basically that will be done um, almost always over the weekend. So generally we do the, uh, symptom evaluations on a Friday or Saturday and then the uh, physical exam on a Saturday just to make it convenient for families. Do participants have to be U.S. citizens? In general, uh, people have to be residents of the U.S., yes. In the child study, does the child have to be able to swallow pills? Yes, we really need the children to be able to swallow the pills uh, because otherwise the stomach acid will just kill them. These are fairly good sized pills, so they're, um, and we'll actually be doing a test even at the start of the study. But we'll also send families a sample of what the pill size is so they'll see. But it's what called, what's called a double O zero pill. It's the same size as the pills uh, for our ANRC. And many children, even as young as five, can swallow them. Um, but they are relatively large pills. How soon after funding will the child study start? Pretty quickly. <laughs> we want to move very quickly. So um, as soon as we get close to funding, and we're already close, we're starting to advertise for two study coordinators. Um, in about, my guess is well within a month, we'll have um, the last step of, of approvals we need, which is IRB approval. So within a month, we would basically be ready to go as soon as we have funding. Other than GoFundMe, how are the funding needs of the trial met? 
So for adult study, the study is primarily funded by the Department of Defense. Uh, they provided a, a $1.3 million grant. Uh, Finch Therapeutics has also provided some support, which we greatly appreciate. And then we um, had a budget shortfall uh, for, of a couple hundred thousand dollars, and families have very generously uh, donated to that. In fact, the last donor gave um, 80,000 more than we needed, and that's going to allow us to do some additional, much more in-depth uh, evaluation of gut bacteria. So the standard methods we've used in the past, we can measure gut bacteria down to a certain level, down to generally a family or genus level. Well, these new methods we're using, um, these new methods that we're using are going to allow us to get down to the species and even the strain level. And that's really important. There are certain number of back, certain type of bacteria we're especially interested in. We really need to get down to that level of detail to really understand what's going on. So we're very excited. We think we're going to learn a tremendous amount from both the adult and the child study about really what bacteria are missing and really what ones are causing problems. Can the adult study and children's study run concurrently when the child study is fully funded? Uh, yes, I may get a few more gray hairs from running two studies at once, uh, but yes, absolutely. We already have um, some dedicated staff for the um, adult study, and we'll just need to hire two additional staff for the child study, but we can do it. For the trial, what happens if your child is in the control group? Well, that's the great thing. It's just like with our adult study. Um, in part one, it is a randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled trial. So half the people get the real treatment, half of them get the placebo. But then in part two, everyone who received the placebo is switched to the real treatment. And so what that means is everyone will get treated. It's just a question of are they treated in the first few months or the next few months, but everyone will be treated. Okay, we're going to switch over to a couple questions about the adult study now. Okay. Can you share the pre preliminary results with the first adult group? We can't um, share full details or any analysis until the study is completed. But what we have been uh, able to do is share some quotes from families. And so if you go to our GoFundMe page uh, for the adult study, uh, at the bottom you'll see several quotes from families that are just very encouraging. We're just seeing great improvements in GI symptoms, in autism symptoms, a lot of improvements in reduction of anxiety and social interaction, uh, improvements in social interaction. Uh, two young men in their mid-20s who had never had a girlfriend now have girlfriends. They are just thrilled. We're seeing a lot of good improvements. There is more than $200,000 raised for the microbiota trial for adults. Would the excess funds go to the trial for children or can work participants be added to the adult trial? We asked out of the donor who donated the last $100,000 to complete the study, and um, we discussed the options with them, and they chose to um, uh, provide to have the funding go for a more in-depth evaluation of gut bacteria. And we think that's very important. We really need this more in-depth evaluation because it's going to allow us to uh, really identify which bacteria are missing and which ones are abnormal. All right, now some more general MTT questions. Are there any safety concerns about MTT? If you'd asked me two months ago, I'd say MTT is exceptionally safe. Um, but the, um, in July, the FDA announced, excuse me, in June, the FDA announced that there were two cases of two recipients who had received uh, FMT from the same donor. And that donor had some nasty drug resistant bacteria. And that caused these two people to become very sick, and one of them died from it. Very sad. And so um, the FDA then asked all research groups doing uh, research on microbiota to do a uh, test for these uh, multiple drug-resistant bacteria. Our group has already been testing for those for a long time, and so it wasn't a risk for us. And so we just replied to the FDA, we're already doing it. Um, we already had a statement about that potential risk um, in our consent form, but because of this new information, we added even more about that. I should point out these two recipient, these two people who became ill were immunocompromised. We don't know the details, but the donor apparently was symptom-free, 
not affected by these bacteria. It's because they had, and these recipients had uh, a compromised immune system. So again, in our studies, first of all, we check to make sure that these bacteria aren't in the donor stool. And then in addition, we check that the recipients don't have a compromised immune system. So we try to be doubly safe. I have a daughter with autism. We want to keep everyone as safe as possible when we do our studies. What bacteria are you most concerned about? That is a great question. So we are concerned both about what bacteria are missing as well as what the pathogenic bacteria are there. So from three studies we've done, we um, have seen the children with autism miss, are missing Prevotella. These are special bacteria that are present in people who have very high fiber diets. And these bacteria consume fiber and produce um, nutrients, special nutrient called butyrate that feeds the cells of your colon, that line your colon, and help keep your colon healthy. So we think the lack of that and also the lack, lack of bifidobacteria are important. Um, but also, there are now seven studies showing that certain species of clostridia are um, very elevated, sometimes 10 to 40 times higher in children with autism. Some strains of clostridia, like Clostridium uh, difficile, um, are very, very dangerous. Clostridium difficile infects about half a million people in the U.S. It causes explosive, life-threatening diarrhea, kills 29,000 Americans a year. That's what fecal transplant is primarily being used to treat, is one dose, one time, 90% cure rate. Kids with autism generally don't have elevated C. diff. They have elevated levels of quite a few other nasty clostridia, um, including uh, C. perfringens and C. bolte. C. bolte is primarily only found in children with autism. It's actually named after an autism mom, Ellen Bolte, uh, who helped lead to the discovery of it. So um, C. bolte is present at level five times higher in children with autism in one study. And so like these other very nasty clostridium, they can affect gut problems, they can affect neurological problems. So we really think those are major issues. We know that vancomycin is very effective against those. Um, and so um, we really think those are primary targets. That's why we need this new type of technology called metagenomics to be able to evaluate these thousands, several thousand species of bacteria at the species level. Because some clostridia are beneficial and some or not. Some are very pathogenic. And so we need to be able to dive down to the species level to differentiate the good clostridia from the bad ones. Depending on the severity of the child's autism, would MTT have to be repeated if the percentage diversity has become average after treatment course is completed? Yeah. We really don't know um, about relationship with severity. In our first study, Almost everyone was severe at the start of the study, um, but there were a few children who were mild and 90% of them improved. So it seems that this treatment affects those, definitely helps those who are severe and probably, uh, and seems to also help those who are mild to moderate. Uh, but we need more of the mild to moderate um, to evaluate, to really know for sure. Um, it seems to affect the benefit all ages, seven to 16 in our first study. And we're certainly seeing a lot of good benefits in adults as well. Um, but certainly some families have lost some GI benefits after a couple of years. And so in some cases, booster doses may be needed. However, in our new studies, we're now using higher doses and longer, and we're exploring higher, uh, longer duration. And so it could be that there'll be less need for boosters. We still have a lot of research to do to figure out what's the best strategy but already these the strategies seem to work very well. A good analogy is imagine people who first discovered aspirin and to treat a headache, do we need a quarter of an aspirin? Do we need 10 aspirin? How many do we need? And so we're really at that stage. We have a, a good first guess as to dosing and duration. We're now working on higher dosing, higher duration, because it seems to be so well tolerated, but we still have a lot to learn about do we need um, uh, to alter uh, to give booster doses for some people. What are the plans for compassionate care? 
Uh, it's a challenging question. Um, there is a, a group at Duke University um, providing compassionate care for people with stem cells and autism, uh, stem cell therapy for people with autism. We've tried to contact them without um, luck. We are we're talking to some experts about compassionate care. Um, the experts have told me they don't think it would be approved for autism. And then I tell them, well, it has been in some cases. So um, we're gathering a little bit more information before we try to uh, talk with the FDA about um, I'm sorry, I, I can only handle so many studies at once. And so we are going to look into it. It's just going to take a little bit of time. Is it possible to do a natural clean out without Moby Prep? It's certainly possible. And in one study we're doing, uh, we're planning to investigate the use of magnesium citrate. I don't think the type of um, clean out is that critical. What's critical is just that you're really well cleaned out until you literally just have uh, a clear liquid coming out of your bottom. Um, and so we think that's very helpful. We want to remove as much of the old bacteria as possible to have less competition for when we give the new bacteria. Do you think MTT will benefit those who have chromosomal abnormalities? I don't think MTT is going to help treat the chromos chromosomal abnormality per se. However, if those people also have GI problems, which is common in, for some single gene disorders related to autism, then we're hopeful it might. And so it was certainly very worthwhile investigating for those people as well. Can you clarify the difference between the ASU and Finch study? Are both studies sourcing for the same product? And if so, why are two studies being done with the same group? Okay. Um, I have a... Um, non-disclosure agreement signed with Finch, so I'm limited as to what I can say. Um, but publicly, um, what I can say is Finch has helped us with our adult study, which we deeply appreciate. Um, the precursor of Finch provided the material for our first child study. Again, we deeply appreciate. Um, and so we stay in close touch with them. We've advised them on their um, uh, child study, and they hope to do one at some point in the future. Um, and, but that's going to be a separate study from the child study that we're doing. Um, and so our hopes is that if our adult study and our child study is successful, that may be enough to convince the FDA to grant approval. If Finch's study would just add additional support for that. Um, so again, the more studies we have, the more likely the FDA is to approve the treatment. How do you attribute or take into consideration for age-related improvement? Um, what we do is um, we are doing a randomized double-blind study. And so over the course of several months, um, especially in young children, you'll see some development. In an older person, it may not be as obvious. That's why we have a control group. So we want to see, does the treatment group gain more benefit over three months than the control group? the placebo group does. Um, but also for some of the tools we use, like the CARS, um, which is our primary assessment for autism symptoms, you inherently compare against what's typical for that person's age, be they three years old or 30 years old. Um, so we certainly hope that there might be even more improvement for very young children. Right now, the FDA has authorized us to go to uh, treat children as young as age five. And we hope if the studies continue to prove to be efficacious and safe, we may be able to go down to even younger ages in future. Do you plan on using the newest sequencing methods to capture a total before and after snapshot of the participant stool? Absolutely. We are so thrilled that we received extra funding from a very generous donor for our adult study. And in that $900,000 estimate, is about $100,000 dedicated for uh, this advanced metagenomics evaluation that will really let us dig down to exactly um, which bacteria are missing and which ones are uh, potential problems uh, in autism. So we're very grateful that we can now have the funding we need to use these um, state-of-the-art, I mean, really cutting-edge methods. Assuming this becomes standard of care, how difficult would this be to find a treatment center for MTT, and will it be covered by insurance? 
So the best analogy is that for um, treating people with C. diff right now with um, uh, fecal transplant, um, there are hundreds of hospitals around the country treating people with C. diff with um, fecal transplant. So in the same way, you don't need any special equipment. These are just pills that you swallow. It's like a probiotic. It's even simpler than the way um, it's usually done for C. diff. So for C. diff patients, they'll still often do an, an a placement via endoscopy, via colonoscopy, or rectal enema, or sometimes a nasal gastric tube. But because we now have it in pill form, we're using a highly purified form that's been freeze dried. So you can just swallow it. And so any doctor in the country should be able to prescribe it um, once it's approved by the FDA. If this does get FDA approved, will there be another uh, supply to meet the high demand? Uh, absolutely. Um, that our collaborators at University of Minnesota have been, um, the university has been very supportive and is doubling their production capability. Um, Finch is certainly working very hard in this also. And so um, uh, we believe that, yes, absolutely, we will eventually be able to meet the demand. Um, but again, it depends on, um, uh, it will take some time to ramp up to treat very large numbers of people. Dr. Klopp is running retreats in Mexico for ASD kids using a similar protocol to your study. What are your thoughts on this retreat? Um, as he is saying, it's similar to MTT. I have spoken with Dr. Klopp several times. In fact, he just sent me an email a few minutes, a few hours ago. Um, but I want to be cautious that um, there are several groups around the world doing microbiota transplant for a variety of conditions, including for autism. Um, the I want those groups to be able to explain to you their own therapies because their own therapies could change. I don't want to give any recommendations. What I will encourage you to, families to do is just compare against what we're doing. So um, are they using vancomycin as a pretreatment? We think that's important. Our current adult study is in investigating whether or not it's needed. But based on what I know, I, I think it's certainly very helpful. Um, but it's possible that microbiota transplant alone may work. But the real, the major issue, I think, is that we use daily microbiota transplant every day for eight weeks. And I think now that even longer would be more beneficial to use it. So I think the key parts of our treatment, and you should ask any uh, clinic about this, um, are they using a pretreatment with Vanco or something similar to Vanco? Are they doing a bowel cleanse with a short fasting period as well and making that bowel cleanse as complete as possible? Are they giving microbiota transplant, hopefully initially very high dose and then later much lower dose? Uh, again, people are very fooled that with C. diff, it's one, pit, one dose, one time, 90% cure rate. We find that for children with autism, every day for many weeks is what's required. So it's much, much more intensive, much, much harder to treat children with autism than people with C. diff. So don't expect one dose is going to help. But I want to make it very clear. We are not recommending do it yourself. Absolutely not. And I am not recommending going to any clinic. I'm just answering the question, is yes, there are clinics outside the U.S. doing it legally, at least legally in those countries? but we definitely do not recommend do it yourself because of this risk. I mentioned these two people who became very ill and one died. Um, so there is some risk um, and so it should definitely be done only as part of a research study like ours, at least in the US. What if one of the phase two trials does not reach and the other does? How will this affect FDA approval? That would be tough. Um, unfortunately, there have been some other um, uh, studies of promising treatments for autism that have been underpowered and have not have had enough participants to quite reach statistical significance. And that's been the kiss of death. That's shut down investigations into those treatments. Um, we have powered our studies so that we are, if the results are similar, actually even half of what we saw in our uh, first child study, and it's 90% likely that we would um, 
see those results. So I'm certainly very hopeful uh, that our results have enough participants in them, but I can't guarantee it. This is brand new research. And so we certainly hope we have enough people. Uh, and so these budget numbers are what we could get for adult study, what we think is reasonable for a child study. If the results aren't quite conclusive, then we just have to go back and do a larger study. And again, normally the FDA expects that with a phase three trial, you need to do 10 to 20 sites, 500 to 1,000 patients. We think we're seeing such a high effect size for this treatment that even these small numbers we're doing, relatively small numbers in our adult and child study, we're 90% confident um, that uh, this will be enough, that each study will be successful. We sure hope so. So how far out are we assuming that we are from getting to FDA approval? Any idea of how the timeline would be? It really depends. If our study is successful and we can apply for breakthrough status, that could be as quick as perhaps a month, excuse me, a year after, yeah, I wish a month, a year after the studies are completed and, and analyzed by the FDA. Um, that's my rough estimate. Um, but if we need to go to a phase three study, that's going to be more challenging because then we'll have to raise of order $100 million to do a, a phase three study if it's done by a pharmaceutical uh, company like Finch. So we certainly are going to do everything we can to help treat the children and adults in our studies as well as we absolutely can. We hope this, the results will be very promising. And if they are, then it's possible that with breakthrough status in perhaps three years, it might be FDA approved. Uh, if we need to do phase three studies, it could be five or six years. Uh, so we'll see. Uh, we're moving as absolutely fast as we can. That ends the official questions I have. There are a couple that have come up in the comment section. Would you mind answering those? Uh, I think we still comments? have time. Yeah, actually, we've been yeah, gone faster than I thought. Exactly. That's great. Okay, so sure, I'll take a few additional questions. There seems to be some concern from people that um, individuals with autism are more likely to be immunocompromised or just have worse immune systems. Is that the similar going to be a similar problem for those two that have the bad reaction due to being immunocompromised? Yeah, so there's certainly uh, the challenge is we don't know the level of immunocompromised uh, in these people, but my suspicion is that they were probably is my guess. My guess is they had a severely immunocompromised system like someone with AIDS or someone on a medication that would shut down their immune system. So we won't accept people into our study or on medications that uh, reduce, uh, severely uh, reduce their immune system. Um, however, um, so some of the things we check for are standard blood cell count. Do they have a normal amount of white blood cells. So uh, we, our study physician will review their medical history in detail. We'll check very carefully. Uh, and we believe that in the vast majority of children with autism, that won't be a problem. Um, but there will be a few children who have a severely compromised immune system for various reasons. And for those, we'll have to exclude at least initially. We want to be safe. But even though we check for those gut bacteria, we want to be doubly safe and make sure the recipients are, are um, reasonably healthy as well. Okay, um, some of these we probably touched on in earlier videos, but since we have some time, um, we might have some new audience, I'm gonna ask them again. So bear with me if you know the answers already. Um, if the placebo, if someone's in the placebo group, will they still get the vancomycin while doing the placebo phase? Um, it depends on the study. So in the adult study, um, the placebo group receives the microbiota, uh, the bowel cleanse of the microbiota, but not the vanco. And the reason for that is that vancomycin, we think, we know is very effective against the clostridia that we're very interested in. The disadvantage is it also affects quite a few other bacteria, including some beneficial bacteria. So there are good things and limitations to it. So we think it's helpful. We used it in our first study and we saw some good initial benefits in a study by Sandler. They used it for eight weeks and found great continuing GI improvements and great continuing in autism improvements. As soon as they stopped treating, those benefits were lost. But I think in part that's because of uh, damage 
uh, to the underlying um, uh, healthy gut bacteria. So we're investigating that as part of our adult study. Banco is needed or not. And I hope to have an answer for you to that in about a year from now. And will we be using vancomycin again in the future child study? We are going to be using the child study because what's most important is that we try to replicate the results of our phase one study. Vanco was, uh, in general, um, very well tolerated. The main issue is that initially we did have um, some, about half to two thirds of the children had a temporary increase in irritability or hyperactivity, and then they got better. In our adult study, we've seen one adult who had severe depression on five different antidepressants. His depression got worse for a few days, and then it got better. And he said he felt better than he ever had before prior to the study. So again, we think that these bad bacteria that the Vanco is killing are causing quite a range of symptoms, hyperactivity, irritability, perhaps depression, and other symptoms too. Um, so we certainly think the Vanco is very helpful, even though it does have this temporary uh, die-off reaction. We think that's actually a good sign, the bacteria being killed, they're releasing all their toxins at once, the toxins that are causing these issues. And we now know which children have that temporary adverse effect uh, to Vanco, and those are the children with worse of those symptoms to begin with, hence probably more of those bacteria causing those symptoms, and hence more of a die-off when those bacteria are eliminated. Um, if someone is doing IVIG, how does this affect them doing this treatment? Um, we'd want to investigate the reason for which they're using IVIG. If they have a low level of a single immunoglobulin, I wouldn't be too concerned. I'd defer, of course, to our study physician. If they're missing all the major immunoglobulins, then I would be uh, very concerned. Um, so it's not the IVIG itself, it's the reason for the IVIG. But IVIG, we think, is, is actually a very beneficial treatment for children with autism. Are there any concerns for using MTT for CVID kids? Um, I'm not familiar with CVID, so um, let's come back to that another time. Okay. If someone wants to email me that question, I'll look it up. Okay. Um, and then let's see. If the recipient takes antibiotics anytime after MTT fixes the gut, will that wipe out the benefits in the gut and return the symptoms? That's a great question. So we were worried because in our first study, one of the patients, um, just after the end of treatment, uh, caught a, a typical strep infection, and they were treated with antibiotics, and we held our breath, and it didn't affect their um, gut or autism uh, benefits. So um, at least in that one case, it didn't. We certainly would recommend minimizing use of antibiotics, but um, because, uh, and especially if you have had your appendix removed, because your appendix is a repository of your gut bacteria. So I'd be more concerned if someone has had their appendix removed, uh, but the appendix seems to serve as a repository of your gut bacteria. So once we've receded it, MTT seems to be lasting in the children for at least uh, two years, and doing very well at two years. So we hope it will last for many years to come. Similarly, in people with C. diff infections, when you treat with antibiotics, the C. diff often comes back. When you treat with microbiota transplant, it's essentially unheard of for C. diff to ever return. You seem to be cured for life in almost all cases. Um, so unless you have an excessive round case of antibiotics, we think it would be safe. But is we'd recommend minimizing them, except for critical needs. Would a perfect gut have high diversity with increased beneficial bacteria or high diversity with no overgrowths? Uh, some of both, actually. That um, in general, higher diversity is associated with a um, uh, better gut, overall gut health. Um, and also, we want to have a few pathogenic bacteria in there. Um, so you want both. You want a lot of the good guys, very few of the bad guys. It's a little simplistic because in some cases, it's actually the balance 
we want to have a good balance. So we still have a lot to learn about what is an ideal gut bacteria and that somewhat depends on the type of food you eat. But I would emphasize that we think diet is also important, not necessarily for, as a treatment uh, for GI problems, but certainly to help prevent them and to help maintain them. So we certainly do recommend high, uh, high fiber diets with a wide diversity of food. Is there any testing that parents can do before the, their kids in the study? Um, what we'll be doing, uh, suggesting to families um, if they're coming from out of state is to we'll tell them the standard test we do, which we think should be done each year during a child's physical, but it's basically a complete blood count and a um, kidney liver uh, function panel, what we call a comprehensive metabolic panel. For example, we had one person, one adult, uh, fly in from out of state and we discovered they had severe anemia. And so we um, recommended they go back and get treated for anemia. Um, after several um, months, they did normalize their blood count and were able to readmit them to the study. Um, so it's very rare that our blood tests find a problem, um, but it would be nice to save people a trip um, through a simple test that they can just order with their physician if they want to before they come. Are the doses of vancomycin and MTT the same regardless of age? Um, we're using somewhat different dosages for our children's study and our adult study. Uh, the vanco is tailored uh, for age. For the um, microbiota, because it's in pill form, uh, we can't easily tailor it. Have you seen a reduction in OCD with MTT in your participant? Um, we have seen some improvements in stereotypic repetitive behaviors. I'm trying to think if we've had many children with OCD. I don't remember off the top of my head. It's not something we normally evaluate for. So I don't can't think of any children who have had a lot of OCD to begin with. So I just say we don't know yet. Where do you find the donors and how do they test to make sure that they don't have anything bad? So we um, do very extensive testing of our donors. Um, so basically beginning with the same sort of testing uh, that the American Red Cross would use for blood donors. And then in addition, um, we do a lot of assessment of GI symptoms, and then also a full test of their um, stool itself, checking for pathogenic bacteria, um, and then additional testing beyond there. And so that's all done by our collaborators at, collaborators at University of Minnesota. One of the things I wanna point out that um, I really like about the way we do this, is unlike with blood donations, where often um, certain blood donations are pooled, uh, and that makes a much, much higher risk of passing on uh, an infection. And I'll point out um, one of the reasons I'm concerned is my, my mother died from a hepatitis C infection she caught from a blood transfusion. Um, so there are risks to um, human products, blood products or stool products. Um, but with the stool donations, we're not pooling them. One do we get uh, donations from one donor, for one person. And so that makes it much, much lower risk uh, than when you're pooling blood donations. So we're really doing everything we can to make it as safe as we can, but no treatment is perfectly safe. What are some things like probiotics and other things that parents can do to support their um, child's gut health? So certainly probiotics seem to be helpful in some cases. The research studies on it are pretty limited. Um, but there are a few studies of probiotics for autism, generally speaking, open label studies um, in limited in size, limited in the methods they use. But for some people, they can be helpful. The problem is there's so many different probiotics on the market. Um, in general, we think higher dose is probably likelier to help. A higher dose seems to rarely cause adverse effects. But with anything, a lower dose and gradually increasing is good. 100 billion or more, uh, we don't really know. Um, we're especially interested in bifidobacteria because we've seen those to be low in children with autism. We've seen them increase fourfold uh, when we give them, uh, when we give microbiota transplants. So we think those are very important. Uh, for very young children, we like B. infantis uh, because that's the gut bacteria that's primarily in an infant's gut when it's uh, nursing from its mother. 
um, little leery of lactobacillus acidophilus because we found in our studies that was a little bit higher in children with autism. But again, these are generalities and it could be different for each person. The other thing is with food, a lot of children with autism are very narrow, self-selected diets of only a few, few foods. And if you're on a few foods, then you're probably more likely to have uh, fewer um, types of gut bacteria. So we think a more diverse diet, especially the phrase we like to use is a rainbow of fruits, a rainbow of vegetables, a wide variety of fruits and vegetables, a variety of protein sources, probably likely to help you get a healthier gut bacteria. Again, these are our guesses, our, our educated uh, estimates of what might be uh, most helpful. Um, and certainly very high fiber diets, which you'll get from eating whole fruits, whole vegetables, whole grain foods. I would recommend going easy on the carbohydrates. Certain clostridia really love carbohydrates and uh, going easy on the carbohydrates, I think is going to be beneficial. That's probably part of the reason why low carb diets are helping some children with autism. Are you still monitoring the results of the earlier study? Are the kids still recovered? Uh, we did. Uh, we just published um, a year ago our phase, uh, uh, the results of the two year follow up. Um, we'll see if we consider doing a longer term follow up than that. All right, that is the end of uh, my questions, and we're about out of time. So unless anyone wants to throw some things in, we've covered most everything at this point. All right. Um, anything, last things you want to say? Well, I, I, again, I just want to thank all the families for their incredible support. Uh, so much appreciated. We're getting close to being able to start a child study. I know there's some more fundraisers coming up, which we deeply appreciate people's support for. Um, and again, we um, are very excited to be moving ahead with our adult study and hopefully soon with our child study. And uh, we'll continue to do some updates um, as people have questions. We did send out some updates to everyone on our email list for the child study and the adult study. If you didn't get one of those updates, short updates uh, within the last week, then you aren't on our list. You're welcome to sign up for them. Uh, with that, again, thank you so much, everyone, for your support. It is just a uh, Deeply, deeply appreciated. With your help, with your help, I hope we can really make a difference in a lot of lives. Um, so thank you.